The United Nations was founded so that we would never forget the crimes of great power. Are we now in danger of forgetting? Last week, Secretary Blinken expressed his view that some of Russia's reported attacks did in fact constitute war crimes. He emphasized that the Department of State and other U.S. departments will be documenting and assessing the facts and the law surrounding these reports. And the doctrinally, we're able to hold responsible under international law those who are directly responsible, those who might be complicit or otherwise engaged in some sort of a joint criminal enterprise with the perpetrators. The doctrine of superior responsibility allows for commanders to be held responsible for acts committed by their subordinates if they're aware of those acts and they fail to either prevent them in advance or punish them after the fact. So all of those sort of criminal law tools could be used by any court that's able to seize jurisdiction in this particular case. American war crimes has its own Wikipedia page, torture, extrajudicial killings, illegal detentions, they've done it all. In April 2010, WikiLeaks released this cockpit video from an Apache gunship in Baghdad in 2007. The gunship is firing from a distance of over a mile from its victims. This is the war you don't see. Clearly, there were two cameramen there holding cameras, not arms. Um, these cameramen turned out to be Reuters news reporters. I haven't seen anything since then. Just fucking, once you get on, just open up. Yeah, Roger, yeah. Um, uh, I see your element, you got uh, well, about four Humvees uh, out along this... Uh, You're clear. Uh, All right, firing. Line here, when the state line, uh, let me know when you have it. What shoot. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. whole street covered with bodies. The reaction to that was nice. Yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. Two six, crazy horse one eight. This tape for me and the other people involved made nice a dirty word. So we just couldn't see something as being nice anymore when a whole street uh, covered with carnage uh, is nice. Ethan McCord was one of the first soldiers to reach the scene of the killing. Here he speaks to an audience in the United States. Myself and the team of soldiers I was with began running in the direction where we heard the Apache fire. Let's shoot. Thank you. I was not even close to prepared for the carnage that I was about to walk onto. I saw what appeared to have been three men on a corner. Got that big pile of bodies to the right on the corner. Yeah, right we got dismounted infantry and vehicles. Over. It was an extreme shock to my system. They didn't look human. Then there was the smell. The smell was un unlike anything I've smelled before. A mixture of feces, urine, blood, smoke, and something else indescribable. Now, Bushmaster, we have a van that's approaching and picking up the bodies. Request permission to engage. Bushmaster 7, roger. This is Bushmaster 7, roger, engage. 1-8, engage. Clear. Come on. Clear. Clear left. Oh yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. <laughs> cool, A for soft four, we call frequency. Yeah, I just drove over a body. <laughs> yeah. Crying. I hear crying. Not cries of pain but that of a small child who had just woken up from a horrible nightmare. Yeah, it looks like we got I saw that there was a minivan, and the cries appeared to be coming from it. Myself and another soldier, a 20-year-old private, walked up to the passenger side van and looked inside. The private that I was with reeled back, began to vomit, and quickly ran away. What I saw when I looked in the van was a small girl about four years old on the passenger side of the bench seat. She had a severe belly wound 
and was covered in glass. Roger, we need, we need a, uh, to evac this child. Uh, she's got a wound in the belly. The glass was in her hair and also in her eyes. Next to her, half on the floorboard, with his head resting on the seat, was a boy about seven years old. He wasn't moving, and from the severe wound to the right side of his head, my first thought was that he was dead. And the driver's seat was who I immediately concluded must have been these children's father by the way he was hunched over the children in a protective manner. The whole time thinking, fuck, what the fuck, these are babies. Hey, uh, I need to get the, rat, the brass to drop ramps. I got a wounded girl, we need to take the rest of my ass. Oh, it's their fault for bringing their kids to a battle. That's right. See, my son was born May 31st, 2007. I had yet to see him. And I had a daughter who was barely older than this girl. The medic radioed in that the little girl needed to be evacuated because there was nothing else he can do here. I handed the child to the medic who then ran the girl to a waiting Bradley armored vehicle. I walked back to the van. I don't know why. I looked inside the van again. Did the boy just move? Holy shit, the boy just moved. I grabbed the boy from the van and held him against my chest. I was screaming at this point, the boy's alive, the boy's alive. I started running to the Bradley in hopes that it wasn't leaving. At this point, the boy looked up at me. Then his eyes rolled back and my heart sunk. It's okay, I have you. It's going to be okay, don't die, don't die. I squeezed him a little bit tighter. I put him into the Bradley as gently as I could. Did you tell uh, battalion that two civilian children casualties are coming back to rest of my and the Bradley over? Roger, that's a negative on, on uh, evac and the uh, two uh, civilian uh, kids to uh, Rocky. They're going to have uh, the uh, IPs will take them up to a local hospital over. What the fuck are you doing, McCord? It was my platoon leader. You need to quit worrying about these fucking kids and pull security, he screamed. At the time, the only thing I can think of was, Roger that, sir. Let me start with Iraq. Who can forget the Abu Ghraib prison? This is where America perfected their war crimes. Prisoners were tortured, raped, sodomized, and killed. All of this is documented. In fact, it was authorized by the U.S. government. Their Justice Department released a memo before the Iraq war. It's called the Torture Memos. What did this document say? One that U.S. officials cannot be charged with war crimes, and two, that enhanced interrogation techniques can be used on prisoners. What are these enhanced techniques? Basically a clever way of saying torture. And two pictures sum up what America did in Abu Ghraib. Here's one of them. The prisoner is made to stand on a box. His head is covered and his fingers are connected to an electric wire. Here's picture number two, it's even worse. Naked prisoners have been piled on top of each other, their heads are covered, and posing behind them are US soldiers, all smiles. This was standard practice, apparently. The CIA regularly clicked naked pictures of their prisoners. The idea was to strip them of all dignity. Many prisoners died during such so-called interrogations. Many are still languishing in so-called US black sites. The people who did this, are not soldiers, they're criminals. But the United States continues to protect them. Let me give you an example. In 2005, a US battalion in Iraq was hit by a roadside bomb in a place called Haditha. 
One soldier was killed, one soldier. The same day, this battalion marched into a neighborhood. They shot and killed 24 women and children. Do you know what the battalion's leader said? Shoot first, ask questions later. And do you know what his punishment was? 90 days in jail plus a pay cut. A pay cut. That's the punishment for taking 24 innocent lives. Here's another example. This is from 2007. A private security company was escorting a U.S. diplomatic convoy in Baghdad. They say they were ambushed. In, re in response, they killed 17 innocent Iraqi citizens. Four of the employees were tried and convicted. But in, de in December last year, Donald Trump, then president, pardoned them. So they're free men now. The fact is America will do anything to protect its war criminals. They will find legal loopholes. They will use their diplomatic power. They will even build a military base on an isolated island to hide their crimes. I'm talking about the infamous Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp, or Gitmo for short. Prisoners say they were tortured with broken glass, strangled with barbed wires, forcefully injected with drugs and repeatedly raped. Remember who's doing this. The supposed human rights champion, the self-proclaimed guardian of freedom. They did the same in Afghanistan. We know the Bagram Air Base is as the crown jewel of the US operation, but that was not always the case. Bagram also houses a detention camp. Prisoners were chained to the ceiling. They were beaten, sexually assaulted and killed. Then you have a list of illegal operations. What's the punishment for such mistakes? Apparently nothing. The Pentagon says no US soldier will be punished. No jail, no demotion, not even pay cuts. And frankly, we should not be surprised. America's drone strikes are among the biggest war crimes in human history. The president orders, the Pentagon pushes a button, and innocent civilians are massacred halfway around the world. Let me show you the numbers. Since 9-11, the US has conducted 100,000 drone strikes. Do you know how many people have they killed? At least 22,000 civilians. The worst estimate is 48,000. Could any other country get away with these crimes? No, they would be sanctioned, at the very least dragged to court. And that's the other issue. The US is yet to join the International Criminal Court, which means the ICC, International Criminal Court cannot prosecute U.S. soldiers. Then who can? American courts. And we all know how that ends. Even if U.S. courts convict a soldier, their president ends up pardoning him. He becomes a decorated war hero instead of a war criminal. Hollywood makes movies on them. Late night shows interview them. This is the reality of the United States. The American war machine is actually a war crime machine. It's about time someone called them out. U.S. soldiers arrive in foreign lands as messengers of peace and freedom, but they leave as merchants of death and destruction. So if Joe Biden wants to talk democracy and human rights, maybe start with your own military. Join the International Criminal Court. Subject your soldiers to independent probes. Until then, do not take the moral high ground because the mass graves in Afghanistan, Syria, Libya and Iraq disagree. The point is that it would be hypocritical of us to say that this is wrong, but the invasion of Afghanistan Iraq, and Iraq and the sanction on Iran, they are all right. Why? Because we automatically assume that the US and the West are beacons of democracy. But what is the US doing right now, which you did not see in your news feed, that did not become the top headline, which wasn't being talked about all over. And this is civilians being killed in US bombing in Syria, right? And I'm holding back the date. Here's the date, 3rd February, 2022. This is just last month, beginning of last month, Six children, four women, 13 people killed in special operations launched by US in the Idlib province, right? In Syria, in someone else's country, right? They've gone and bombed these places. So the US is known to be the big brother across the world. But do we have to be um, hip hypocrites like that to assume that what the US does is right and what Putin does is wrong. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. But another thing that I want you to see 
Israel, our big friend, and we all hold Israelis as our big heroes now, right? What does Israel do in the Palestinian regions, in the Gaza Strip? Here is a list of uh, the number of children killed, Palestinian children killed in Israeli attacks between 1987 and 2022, right? And the source is Beth this is not an Arab source. This is not something which is critical of Israel. This is a source within Israel. This is run by a Jewish uh, group which wants to end the war. And this is the number of children killed. 2,464 children killed. This is the record by Beth Salem. If you look at Palestinian records, the record, this would be four or five times higher. Do you see anyone talk about that? Do you talk about that? Is it on your WhatsApp message group? If it's not, and it's happening every single day, and this is just killed, children maimed, injured, that's a very, very high number as well. And I'm only talking about children here. The adults, it's endless. The number of fruit trees cut down, the way in which it has been turned completely barren, the Gaza area, right? Do a little bit of research on Google. Go to YouTube. You'll find a lot of documentaries which don't make the headlines right there for you to watch. And the Western media, and unfortunately our mainstream media, will never tell you these things. And I'm just going to give you an example of how Time magazine reports these wars. Time, when Time magazine reports it, here is Serbia, right? And what it says, bringing the Serbs to heel. And that is Time magazine's a massive bombing attack opens the door to peace. A massive bombing attack opens the door to peace. That's what Time magazine says. And look at the spin there. A bombing attack is peaceful. And again in Iraq, right? Saddam Hussein, overthrown by the American army, invading army, illegally. He's a sovereign leader of a sovereign nation, supposedly with WMDs. Time, we got him. We got him. This is the Time magazine, right? Respected magazine. What happens when Putin enters uh, Ukraine? The return of history, how Putin shattered Europe's dreams. Now, look at the comparison right there on your screen. Bringing the Serbs to heel, massive bombing campaign, bombing attack opens the door to peace. And on your right is the return to history. A return to history is in some ways um, an allusion to what happened when Hitler started taking over countries nearby. So this is how it's being reported. Now, this war right now is being led by Putin. It has been created over a period of time because of conditions of conflict between two sides, Russia on the other one side and NATO on the other. The victims of it are the Ukrainian people. But remember, when you feel sympathy for the Ukrainian people, which you must, you, when you feel angry that there's war and you feel worried about war and you want peace, do look into your own heart and say, do, would you do it again when the Israeli forces kill more Palestinians? Will you do it again when the US bombs and in collateral damage, some civilians die in some other poor country? Let me start with some questions tonight. What was America's war on terror really about? Was it about gunning down terrorists? Or was it about killing civilians and bombing nations to control them? I'm sure you know the answer. I'm sure you've seen many headlines and exposés this year. Tonight, we come to you with more proof. The United States is no guardian of human rights. It is guilty of war crimes. Let me show you some headlines from this year. The U.S. drone strike in Kabul was a quote-unquote mistake. An American bomb killed seven children. The U.S. blamed it on faulty intel. Here's another one. U.S. military concealed Syria airstrike that killed dozens of civilians. It led to one of the largest civilian death tolls in the war. But there was no punishment for the U.S. And this has become a trend. 
The United States of America bombs countries at will and gets away with it. That's because nobody is holding them accountable. Neither international agencies nor international media and certainly not our leaders. So tonight we want to tell you about an American war crime, yet another American war crime. This one is from Syria. What did the US do? They ran a death squad, a secret mission. They ran it for five years. This group, the death squad, pounded Syria with more than 100,000 bombs and missiles, 100,000. They killed innocent civilians. How do we know about this? A recent report has exposed this secret strike cell. This group was called Talon Anvil. What is Talon Anvil? That's code name for a secret American military unit. It operated from 2014 to 2019 for five whole years. This unit was led by members of the Delta Special Forces. Delta is a special operations force of the U.S. Army. Their elite soldiers are said to be the best of the best. So what were they doing with Talon Anvil? They were bombing Syria at will. They bombed whatever they thought was a target. This group was first stationed in Iraq. Then they were moved to northern Syria. The team had less than 20 officers. They worked round the clock and in three shifts. This was basically a 24 by 7 operation. Talon Anvil monitored what was happening on the battlefield. They had giant television screens. That's what they used to monitor action on the battlefield. And whenever they spotted something they thought was suspicious, they ordered a strike, just like that. No background checks, no effort to verify any tip-offs. You see movement you don't like and you strike. That's how they operated for five years. How many bombs and missiles did they drop? 112,000, that's one estimate. 112,000 bombs in five years. Who were they hitting? But on the ground, these bombs were killing civilians, farmers, children on the street, families fleeing the war, villagers taking shelter inside buildings. They were all hit. And this went on for five years, let me repeat that. Talon Anvil was killing civilians for five years. Did nobody notice? Did nobody object? The answers are yes and yes. Their actions were noticed and there was some protest. Some American pilots flying over Syria opposed Talon Anvil. On some occasions, they refused to drop bombs. Why? Because they were asked to hit, quote unquote, questionable targets in densely populated areas. Officers from the CIA also complained. They were worried about what they called a disturbing pattern of strikes. Even within Talon Anvil, some members refused to participate in, this, in these airstrikes. But such interventions were few and far between. Also, they were ineffective. Many of these complaints went to top military leaders. What did they do? Reports say they chose to look the other way. Many officers, in fact, believed that civilian deaths were unavoidable. Allow me to quote what one officer told a newspaper off the record. This is what he said. The officer said, and I'm quoting, he, he saw so many civilian deaths, he eventually came to accept them as part of the job. The question is, who gave the U.S. his job to kill civilians in far-off lands and justify it? Who will hold the U.S. to account for this? The doctrine of superior responsibility allows for commanders to be held responsible for acts committed by their subordinates. I was taught in school that the Nazi leaders were all convicted in the Nuremberg trials, that justice was served. But did you know that only 10 Nazis were hanged and only seven went to jail? That's it. The big Nuremberg trials, only 17 of them? Did you actually think, like I did, they all got what they deserved? Well, think again. They had way too much knowledge. Most of them were welcomed with open arms. NATO, NASA, they all lost them.
With the horrific war in Ukraine escalating and the suffering of Ukrainian people increasing, Hillary Clinton and Tony Blair are advocating for stronger military responses. Should we listen to them? Tony Blair says the West is too timid. <laughs> well, maybe for you, mate. You demand that we make up porky pie lies in order to go to war with Iraq, if I remember rightly, and I think I do. So Tony Blair, sir, I'm not even going to say it. Tony Blair has issued a veiled attack on Joe Biden and the West as he criticised the strange tactic of promising not to fight Russia. Bloody hell, that's one of the few things I thought we agreed on, is that you don't want actual combat. Do we agree on that? I don't know. I'm learning sort of slowly about this situation. See what Hillary Clinton's been saying. We need a strong democracy in the United States. Yes, we do, Hillary. Where are the emails? To win the global argument with autocracy. A strong democracy is also a precondition to mobilising the resources necessary to deter aggression and compete economically and militarily. That's a call for more military spending. You see the uh, Clinton Foundation, just have a little glance at where it gets much of its funding and see if that would affect Hillary Clinton's perspectives on war, which have always been pretty favourable. It's so, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed. Yes, we remember. came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> By contrast, a weak and fractured democracy at home will only embolden our adversaries and invite further aggression. If you ever wonder why people are cynical about Hillary Clinton, look at this sentence again. By contrast, a weak and fractured democracy at home will only embolden our adversaries and invite further aggression. That is code for shut up, toe the line, don't dispute our narrative, because that's a weak and divided democracy. A strong democracy is a democracy where everyone agrees with one another and does exactly what we tell them to do. Caitlin Johnston writes, International law is a meaningless concept when it only applies to people the US Power Alliance doesn't like. Neither George W. Bush nor Tony Blair are in prison cells at The Hague where international law says they ought to be. I'm not saying that's where they ought to be. Who cares what I say? International law says they should be. Sometimes I can't even fathom that. You know when people say bang Tony Blair and George W. Bush up, especially new George W. Bush, like doing all the paintings and being mates with Ellen and we like him now, right? Like, but apparently, according to the old international law that they love so much, Bang him up down the Hague. Bush is still painting away from the comfort of his home, issuing proclamations comparing Putin to Hitler and platforming arguments for more interventionism in Ukraine. Blair is still merrily warmongering his charred little heart out, <laughs> saying NATO should not rule out directly attacking Russian forces in what amounts to a call for a thermonuclear world war. It kind of does in a way, doesn't it? I mean, I would have thought that these highly educated, highly experienced diplomats and politicians might appreciate some of the complexity and the necessity for a diplomatic solution. When you point out this obvious plot hole in discussions about the legality of Vladimir Putin's invasion, you'll often get accused of whataboutism, which is a noise that empire loyalists like to make when you've just highlighted damning evidence that their government's behaviours entirely invalidate their position on an issue. Obviously something that we've been confronted with, attempts to censor, control, criticise and dismiss the stories that we tell, the opinions that we offer, the questions that we ask. Oh, no, well, and again, look how it all toes the line. Now, those of you that believe that there is a centralising globalist conspiracy, like that WEF and Davos are all attempts to create one unifying global voice where everyone plays by the same rules, plays with the same ball, that the big technocratic powers and big tech powers all come together to govern us and make sure that we own nothing and are happy, we'll be interested to hear a statement like, by contrast, weak and fractured democracy at home will embolden our adversaries. That is Hillary Clinton saying we don't have room for multiple voices. We don't have room for dissent. Now, Caitlin Johnston points out that anyone, commentators, journalists like her or vloggers like us can't go, oh, what, what, you know, oh, that's what about ism. That's what about ism. Shut up. Do as you're told. Put your badge on and shut your mouth.
This is not what aboutism. It's a direct accusation that is completely devastating to the argument being made because there really is no counter argument. That's another thing. When there is no counter argument, they attack you as an individual or they just try and shut you down. Or they say that you're something, usually something that you're not, in order to shut you down. Or they say, in this case, maybe, oh, you don't care about Ukrainian people. Or in the case of the pandemic, you don't care about people dying. I do care about Ukrainian people. I do. I'm telling you, well, if I'm telling you, I do. What, what do you mean? Or I, I do care about people, but I'm a person. I care about people. Is, could it be, and here's another alternative theory, is it that you just don't like anybody questioning the outcomes you desire? The Iraq invasion bypassed the laws and protocols for military action laid out in the founding charter of the United Nations. It was only in our founding charter. The current US military occupation of Syria violates international law. Literally happening now. International law only exists to the extent to which the nations of the world are willing and able to enforce it. And because of the US empire's military power, and more importantly, because of its narrative control power, this means international law is only ever enforced with the approval of that empire. Them international laws are only applied when they're in alignment with the agenda of powerful central elite forces. If they're not, they just ignore them. Uh, the international law says that Blair and Bush have been hate. Uh, it don't matter. It's okay when they do it. The international law says that they don't invade Syria. Uh, it's okay when we do it. International law says Russia shouldn't invade Ukraine. Yeah, right. Let's get on that one. Some money to be made in that one. That's good. Now, I'm not saying that Russia aren't wrong or Ukrainian people aren't suffering. Of course, they obviously are. Tell me what I can do. And if your only answer when I ask, what can I do is, don't offer any counter narratives. Shut up. Don't talk about it. I remember two weeks ago, that was the pandemic, right? Don't talk about it. We just need to get everyone vaccinated. Uh, shut your mouth. The unvaccinated are causing it. Well, where's all that now? This is why the people indicted and detained by the International Criminal Court, ICC, are always from weaker nations, overwhelmingly African. Oh, it's a theme developing. While the USA can get away with actually sanctioning ICC personnel if they so much as talk about investigating American war crimes and suffer no consequences for it whatsoever. It's also why Noam Chomsky famously said that if the Nuremberg laws had continued to be applied with fairness and consistency, then every post-World War II US president would have been hanged. Oh my God, all of them? That's mental. The US continually works to subvert international law enforcement institutions to advance its own interests which was rejected as a slogan to go under the flag. When the US was seeking UN authorization for the Gulf War in 1991, Yemen dared to vote against it. But it's all all right over in Yemen now, right? After which, a member of the US delegation told Yemen's ambassador, that's the most expensive vote you ever cast. That's gangster stuff. Yemen lost not just $70 million in US foreign aid, but also a valuable labor contract with Saudi Arabia and a million Yemeni immigrants were sent home by America's Gulf state allies. Fucking hell. They don't like criticism, do they? Are we just worried in case there isn't no weapons of mass destruction, in case that dossier is... Right, get them fucking immigrants out! 70 million contracts and when Saudi Arabia bomb you, don't come fucking running to us! Simple observation of who is subject to international law enforcement and who is not makes it clear that the very concept of international law is now functionally nothing more than a narrative construct used to bludgeon and undermine governments who disobey the US centralised empire. That's why in the lead up to this confrontation with Russia, we saw a push among empire managers to swap out the term international law with rules-based international order, which can mean anything and is entirely up to the interpretation of the world's dominant power structure. If we say international law, people may point out that we ourselves regularly break international law. Call it something else, something made up, but a bit shit and bureaucratic and difficult to understand and dissect. How about rules-based international order? Yeah, that's pretty vague. You can argue with logical consistency that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is wrong and will have disastrous consequences far beyond the bloodshed it has already inflicted. But what you can't do with any logical consistency whatsoever is claim that it is illegal because there is no authentically enforced framework for such a concept to apply. Right, because I suppose law is about precedent, isn't it? Like you establish the principle and then you use the precedent. That's how like your law over there works. I think our law does over here. You know, so you can't just say, what about Iraq? Oh, well, uh, sorry about that. What about Yemen when you fuck them up? Oh, look, 
Look, we're not talking about international law. This is a rules-based international order. And what does that mean? What do I fucking say it means? As US law professor Dale Carpenter has said, if citizens cannot trust that laws will be enforced in an even-handed and honest fashion, they cannot be said to live under the rule of law. Instead, they live under the rule of men corrupted by the law. This is all the more true of laws which would exist between nations. Don't you feel sometimes that the rules and regulations and laws are shifting, that the values and principles, one minute this is okay, next minute that's okay, these people can do this, these people can say that, we're meant to be fair over here, but we're not meant to be fair over there. That is no values or principles. If they sh Value and principle means it doesn't change. It doesn't change. With true values and principles, you change in order to fit in with them. You don't change them in order to fit in with you. You don't get to make international law meaningless and then claim that an invasion is illegal. That's not a legitimate thing to do. As long as we're living in a Wild West environment created by a murderous globe-spanning empire which benefits from it, claims about the legality of foreign invasions are just empty sounds. Joe Biden has publicly said that he wants a new world order and a regime change in Russia. But if you think that he wants a new world order and a regime change in Russia, you're a conspiracy theorist, right? Hello there, you 5.3 million awakening wonders. We continue to journey, don't we, against the odds in spite of the obstacles. You know they want you dumb, don't you, that they need you docile and compliant. You noticed it when you was at school. You've seen it your whole life. It continues still, the endless bombardment of muddying information. A little while ago, on the telly or whatever, Joe Biden goes, oh, I want a new world order. And he also said, I want a regime change in Russia. And the mainstream media, those guys, the corporate media, the legacy media, you use your phrase, let me know in the comments what you prefer, said, oh, the conspiracy theorist, just because Joe Biden's saying he wants a new world order and a regime change, they're thinking he wants a regime change and a new world order. I mean, it's not as if America has a long, rich history of changing regimes and trying to establish a new world order, is it? Joe Biden either said those things by mistake, or he said them because they're sort of on his mind and that, the way you sort of, if you've like just ate a donut, you might say, oh, this is a sweet situation with a hole in the middle. Of it. it might just might be in the middle of your mind. I don't know how the human brain works. Now, should we have a little look at uh, Joe Biden? We are at an inflection point, I believe, in the world economy, not just the world economy, in the world. It occur occurs every three or four generations. God, Joe Biden's a bit boring, isn't he? It's really quite hard watch, isn't it? I'm really trying to concentrate, but... I've got that feeling I've got, you know when someone boring starts talking to you, you think, oh shit, oh no, they're not going to stop. You sort of have to sort of steal yourself, like organise your face. What face should I do while this boring person talks? But then inside you're thinking, shut up! This is boring! Are you being deliberately boring? Are you trying to bore the life right out of me? I'm not being critical of him because he's old and that. Old people, who don't love an old person? I'm saying that he's making geopolitics and a potential world war seem like a really tiresome thing, like he's describing something that happened to him in a bowling alley in 1950. Oh, and I reckon eight of the pins went down. Oh, shut up! And now's the time when things are shifting. We're gonna, there's gonna be a new world order out there. Oh, what? Hang about. There's gonna be a new world order out there. It's nay on the new world order, nay! It's nay on the new world order! So the first thing they'll do is try to hit you on the head with a conspiracy theorist hammer. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist! You're saying stuff! You're saying stuff that's not, not on proper news! Shut up, conspiracy theorist! And then, like, if that don't work, if you go, no, actually, this is not conspiracy theorist, I can rationally explain to you exactly what I mean. Ah, well, you don't care about Ukrainian people, do you? What about Ukrainian people? I do care about Ukrainian people. I'm just actually trying to understand this situation using information outside of the sources issued to me by people that possibly benefit from a sustained state of war globally, continually. As Glenn Greenwald said, the things that are tragic about the war in Ukraine are common to all wars. It's terrible that people are suffering. It's terrible that a refugee crisis is being induced. This is true of all wars, even wars that overtly, financially and politically benefit sanctioned nations. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Capping a series of diplomatic summits in Europe, Mr Biden delivered a speech on Saturday in Poland about the war in Ukraine and apparently ad-libbed remark at the conclusion of his address. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. 
quickly eclipsed the rest of his speech. Ad lib. It's not Miles Davis. Boop, 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 boop. Ad lib it may well have been, but it's an ad lib that is somewhat in keeping with American foreign policy in the last 50, 60 years or so. Administration officials and lawmakers stressed that the United States was not seeking regime change in Russia. We do not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. Regime change in Russia? No, I mean, over in Yemen. I mean, nowhere, nowhere in Syria. No, we don't do regime change. What does that even mean? I've never even heard that. Fra- regime change. Oh, yeah, no, no, we wouldn't do that. Said Secretary of State Anthony J. Blinken. The remarks were the most explicit yet from the US president. He sees no future for Putin as Russia's head of state. What is exactly the aim? Asked former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis in an interview. Is it regime change in Russia? Well, whenever the United States tried regime change, it didn't turn out very well and has never been tried with a nuclear power. The fact is, is that when a president says something about regime change, it's not a ludicrous and outrageous tangent that he's exploring some mad riff like James Joyce on a stream of consciousness. He's talking about stuff that happens all the time. Look, if you're not questioning the US agenda, then I don't think you know how to ask questions. If you're just blindly accepting what you're being told, this is a humanitarian issue for Ukrainian people. Uh, what about all the other times in the past when we found out that there was like some mineral or resource thing? Yeah, and I've changed since then. That was, I was nuts then. But now, no, I've really got myself together. Now, this is not saying that Ukrainian people aren't suffering. Obviously, they are. That's not saying that Russia haven't got their own mendacious oligarchical agenda. Obviously, they do have. I'm not like, oh, Russia's a great country. I presume Russia, like all powerful nations, is run by people that are corrupt. That would be my assumption. A US president who during an atrocious war does not mean what he says on matters of war and peace and must be corrected by his hyperventilating staff, said Varoufakis, is a clear and present danger to all. Now, a lot of people have said that about Biden for a while, haven't they? Sometimes it seemed a little bit mean, but there he is out there. Now that's become his excuse. What they denied? No, what this guy, he's clear as a bell. He may be old, but he knows what's going on. Hey, I'm going to do a regime change. It's a new world order. I fucking hell, he's nuts, this guy. You see how old he is? Come bath time, give him a blanket. You don't listen to him. We won't even let him use the remote control. Why, what's on? What's this do? Get rid of Putin. I'm taking me a laptop. You naughty boy. Talking of conspiracy theories, here are some conspiracy theories that actually happened. US intervention. Let's just list them. Between 1947 and 1989, the United States tried to change other nations' governments 72 times. I mean, if you do anything 72 times, if it was like goals scored from free kicks or three pointers scored in basketball, you'd say, well done. It includes 66 covert operations and six overt ones. Well, that's more than a hobby, isn't it? Also, by the way, it's not a right-wing thing or a left-wing thing, is it? Because you've had, over that course of time, you've had everyone have a little go. And what I can test is there ain't no bloody real difference. Most US secret wars were against other democratic states. What he's saying in his speech and the bits we're meant to take seriously, not that bit, that bit's good. No, he meant that bit. No, he didn't mean that bit. Pfft, oh, that was a fart. He didn't mean that bit. Then the main thrust was, we're going to do democracy. We're going to have a big lightning democracy show, right? Well, they were doing secret wars against democratic states. So is it right or is it wrong? Haven't you noticed that these days? The peculiar elasticity and then sudden rigidity of morality. Morality can go, whoop, we're allowed to do this now. Jim, you mustn't say that. You mustn't say that. That was wrong. Like, what is it then? No one's got any principles. No one's got any actual values. Globally, there were 117 partisan electoral interventions between 1946 and 2000. The majority of these, almost 70% of them, were by the US. 21 such interventions took place between 1990 and 2000, of which 18 were by the US. They're the Beatles of interventions. 60 different independent countries have been the targets of such interventions. Two thirds of interventions were done in secret, with voters having no idea that foreign powers were actively trying to influence the results. Now, I don't know what that is, a conspiracy theory or what but it don't sound like democracy does it our friend caitlin johnston the great writer says all the self-righteous posturing by the western political media class about the need to pour weapons into ukraine is not really about saving ukrainian lives only negotiating a ceasefire can do that that makes sense doesn't it but about seizing this golden opportunity to hurt russia's geostrategic interest as much as possible conspiracy theory Ukraine, on its own, is powerless to stop Russia from taking Kiev, no matter how many weapons are sent, but those weapons can be used to fight a long, bloody insurgency, which costs many more lives, keeps Moscow militarily preoccupied and hemorrhaging money, and ultimately hurts Putin's popularity at home. 
This by itself will do a great deal to advance US interests, but on top of that, you've got the even greater benefit of manufacturing international consent for unprecedented acts of economic warfare against the entire nation of Russia, as well as killing Nord Stream 2 and rallying immense support for NATO and the imperial military intelligence machine. The Western world is now a united front against the menace of Vladimir Putin, in much the same way it united against the threat of global terrorism after 9-11, and we're probably only seeing the beginning of the agendas that this will be used to roll out. We can expect these agendas to be used in an attempt to impoverish, undermine, agitate and ultimately collapse and balkanise Russia. This would leave China standing alone without its nuclear superpower guard bear and much more vulnerable to imperial operations geared toward thwarting the emergence of a true multipolar world, a goal US imperialists have had in writing for three decades. That sounds a bit like a kind of new world order, doesn't it? And it doesn't sound ridiculous and implausible when you break it down like that. If Caitlin Johnston were a lawyer and we were looking for motivation, oh, the balkanisation, the breaking down of Russia, the removal of that threat, the prevention of a multipolar world and the possibility of a centralised force that built up of American-sponsored institutions, agencies, non-government organisations and large corporations are now free to maraud across the world in pursuit of their interests without any counter-narrative or threat. Now, that, to me, isn't like something you can definitely prove, but it's not a wacky conspiracy theorist, is it? Not when you remind yourself, between 1947 and 1989, the United States tried to change other nations' governments 72 times. Yeah, but 73, we would never do that. It includes 66 covert operations, so most of the time, they didn't tell you. Only six times. Like, look at the headlines again. New World Order jumped on by conspiracy theorists. Oh, where's your tinfoil hat? Well, where my tinfoil hat is, is over there. Here are my files of times where this happened again and again and again in the past. And attempting to understand American foreign policy does not exonerate Russians' actions in Ukraine. And the reason we're not talking about that particularly is because that's already on the news. You can watch that stuff whenever you want. It's a tragic, awful, terrible situation. But what it isn't is a passport to not discussing the complex realities, the historical global narratives, for which there's considerable evidence. And I think ignoring that would not make you like, I don't know, some patriot of kindness, but a sort of idiot. No meaningful diplomatic effort is being made by Washington to end the violence. Ukrainian lives are being spent like pennies to facilitate the agenda of US planetary domination by whipping up international support for the strangulation of Russia while pouring vast fortunes into the military industrial complex rather than taking even the tiniest step toward de-escalation and diplomacy. Do we forget the lies that justified the conquest of Iraq and disguised America's plans to dominate all the world? Do we forget that the British government has announced, for the first time, that it's prepared to launch an attack with nuclear weapons, echoing yet again George Bush? And do we accept a distortion of intellect and morality that empties noble words like democracy and liberation of their true meaning, that says it's wrong for a terrorist to kill innocent people, but right for governments to commit the same crimes in our name. The answer is that we need not accept any of this if we recognize that there are now two superpowers. One is the regime in Washington, the other is public opinion, now stirring all over the world, perhaps as never before. Make no mistake, it's an epic struggle. The alternative is not just the conquest of faraway countries, it's the conquest of us of our minds, our humanity, and our self-respect. If we remain silent, victory over us is assured. Almost every nation has invested enormous amount of money in building and stockpiling arms, armaments, bombs, missiles. So all of us as people, were we all thinking all these bombs are being kept for entertainment, for display or it's artwork? What do you think? One day it will be used. The question is on whom? Wars are almost inevitable because economies are built on war. So we have no intent of stopping the war. Let's be clear about that. When it happens to us, we will cry. When it's happening somewhere else, it's drama. This inhuman attitude towards war 
and to killing and the suffering that other people go through, we must come out of that. Because most evil things have happened, not necessarily because of evil intentions, simply apathy. You sleep through life, that is what is happening to the world, both in terms of soil and in terms of war. We sleep through. After World War II, we formed League of Nations, we made United Nations. The idea was never again such wars will happen, right? Since then, how many wars? Actually, if you look at it, there's not been a single day's break on this planet after World War II without at least a battle going on somewhere. We are not saying we are not in such a la-la land that we don't have any issues. We have issues. But this is the idea of setting up a platform which would solve problems. <laughs> we have pushed it to the side and doing what we want. So how do we wake up? First thing is, within your hearts, your anger and hatred must go. I must tell you this. And you, in your own way, you are in your own population. И люди не чувствуют опасности. Вот меня что беспокоит. Ну как, вот, как мы не можем понять? Мы, мы тащим мир вообще в, в совершенно новое измерение. Вот в чем проблема. Делают вид, что как будто ничего не происходит. Но я не знаю даже, как достучаться. The world is going to be blown to pieces. We have stupid people now running our country. The world is going to be blown to pieces. What are you thinking about? If the nuclear bomb were to explode right now, what would you choose? Live or die? Live? Yeah, because if I died, then there would be a lot of things I couldn't do anymore. I never see my family again. I miss the sun on my face. I never eat my favourite food again. Never travel. Never be in love. I wouldn't live. What about you? What would you choose? Live or die? Die. Because if I survived, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of things anymore. I'd never see my family again. I'd miss the sun on my face. I'd never taste my favourite food again. I'd never travel. Never be in love. I wouldn't live. The United Nations was founded so that we would never forget the crimes of great power. Are we now in danger of forgetting? Do we forget the lies that justified the conquest of Iraq and disguised America's plans to dominate all the world? And do we accept a distortion of intellect and morality that empties noble words like democracy and liberation of their true meaning? that says it's wrong for a terrorist to kill innocent people, but right for governments to commit the same crimes in our name. The answer is that we need not accept any of this if we recognize that there are now two superpowers. One is the regime in Washington, the other is public opinion, now stirring all over the world, perhaps as never before. Make no mistake, it's an epic struggle. The alternative is not just the conquest of faraway countries, it's the conquest of us, of our minds, our humanity, and our self-respect. If we remain silent, victory over us is assured. Don't buy into the shadow's dream. Wake up, recreate yourself anew. You are the one you have been waiting for. Are you ready to win?